What is going on YouTube? Gavin here and I bought a 3D printer. So I've been wanting to buy a 3D printer for a very long time, mostly because I couldn't wrap my head around spending so much money on something that I didn't know if I liked or if I could make a good use of. So when I finally found out about the Creality Ender 3, I was surprised to see a pretty nice package for a price that low, so I, I just pulled the trigger and bought it. So the Ender 3 comes out for about 200 euros or dollars, so in my opinion the price is pretty good, also considering the quality of the prints and 200 euros isn't really that much money once you start looking at the market and uh, looking at other printers and their respective prices. So let's just say the Ender 3 is a very good printer, I mean the build quality is amazing, just look at it, it's mostly aluminum, it's pretty refined, even the power supply is probably covered and that's a really nice starting point. The quality of the prints is also pretty good. I mean, it's improvable from what you get out of the box, but for starters, it's already good enough. So this 3D printer is sold as a kit, and to be honest, I was expecting a box of parts. Fortunately, that's not what I got. Instead, the Ender tree was actually half-built. The whole bottom part, in fact, was already pre-built for me. And that's very important in my opinion, because for someone that's new to 3D printing, has never assembled a 3D printer before, skipping like half of the work is a huge thing. So what was left for me to do was building like from the bottom up the topmost part of the printer. And while it wasn't as difficult as I initially thought, it was pretty time consuming. And the instructions weren't particularly clear either. I had to resort to third party instructions and YouTube videos to actually understand how to perform some steps of the building process. So before actually getting to the printer itself, I want to suggest you some upgrades you can make to the Ender Tree. So uh, if you happen to have or want to buy this, this actual printer, these upgrades are very important, uh, some more than others, but they will make your life easier and maybe even improve your print quality. And some of them will definitely avoid some problems that you may have along the way. So let's start off with this filament guide. This is a very important print because it allows the filament to make this softer cure instead of getting to the extruder with a very steep angle. And this prevents the filament from bending and even possibly snapping. And this alone will avoid you lots of problems. Next off on the list is this very simple fan cover. As you see, there is a fan grill on top of the motherboard compartment of the Ender 3. And actually it's a very important position for a fan to be in. When you scrape your prints off your, off your printer, it can happen that some residue or debris can get into this fan grill, possibly damaging the fan. Also, if you're using some conductive filament, I don't know what would happen if some of it were to touch the motherboard. So a very simple print and a must have upgrade for the Ender 3. Another very simple but pretty important upgrade is this very simple anti-snag guide. So this tooth looking thing prevents the cables like from the heated bed and the ones going to the hot end to catch onto the metal extrusion on the back. This is actually more important than it looks because it happened to me a couple of times that the cables just catch there and fortunately I was home when that happened and I had to stop the print. So just save yourself the mess and print this very little and simple upgrade. So another design flaw with the Ender 3 is that the LCD PCB is actually exposed. It has no cover on it by default and it just sits there waiting for something bad to happen. So again, this is a very simple upgrade it's just an LCD cover and you can print two kinds of these. Uh, there is one that uses factory screws but the holes are a little bit deeper and it's actually a little bit more difficult to print. And there's another one that uses like third party screws uh, but they're just M3 screws so you can just buy them from a hardware store and that's the one I actually use. So this just goes on the back of the LCD, it covers the PCB and overall it doesn't even look bad. So the next upgrade I want to talk about is not actually very important, but it can improve print quality, especially if you want to print like 
uh, difficult overhangs or something like that. So this system you see here is called Pets Find Bullseye and it's a replacement for everything that goes around your hot end. To sum it in a few words, this is no more than a better cooling system for your filament. It uses the stock fans, there is not one that's more powerful but requires a third party fan, but I found out that this actually makes the overhang sprint quite better by itself. So this is not one of the easiest upgrades to install on your printer, mostly because you have to be a little more adventurous and actually disassemble everything that's around the hot end. It uses both your factory screws and some different M3 screws that you can buy from the hardware store. Also it requires some M3 nuts, so it's definitely a more challenging upgrade and while it's not uh, strictly required. If you want to experiment with it down the road, feel free to. It's a very nice upgrade and it also looks pretty nice in my opinion. So enough about printed upgrades and let's actually talk about a pretty big problem I experienced with the Ender Tree. So when I was printing something with circles in it, I noticed that the circles were actually distorted and they were not really round at all. Uh, they were more oval and deformed. I had no idea what was causing this problem, I didn't know if it was something about like build plate adhesion or maybe problems with the model or, or the plastic shrinking, so I just printed this very simple cheese slice looking test that basically showed me that the circles were all deformed in a similar fashion. And once I got that, I found out that the problem was actually lying into the x-axis timing belt. So the thing about this timing belt is that you have to install it yourself, so it's not really pre-assembled. Apparently there are some manufacturing tolerance issues here, because the timing belt is actually a little bit loose. So there is no proper way to tension the x-axis belt, but I just found a different solution, well more of a hack to be honest, but it's been working great. So I just took a cable tie and wrapped it around like the end of the timing belt. And what this actually did was putting tension on the belt itself and this solved my problem completely. I printed another circle test and the circles were now perfect and I couldn't be happier with the results. So to actually tell the printer what to print and how to print it, you have to use a piece of software that's called a slicer. The job of the slicer is to take some 3D model, mostly STL files, elaborate it according to your particular printer or the particular material you're using to print and convert it to a G-code. So a G-code is no more than a set of instructions uh, that you give your printer so that it knows uh, where to move, how to move and the temperature of the bed or the hot end. So to actually inject G-code in your printer you have mostly two methods. One is using a micro SD card and there's actually one included with this 3D printer and while it works and it's decently easy like you just take the SD card, put it in your computer, uh, transfer the G-code file, put the SD card back into the printer and uh, just select print into the printer menu itself. As you probably have guessed, it's a pretty tedious process and there is actually another way to control your printer that makes it as easy as just pre pressing a couple of buttons on your computer. I'm talking about Octoprint. So Octoprint is a web server service that you host yourself on, well really you can host it uh, on every computer you have, but it makes most sense using a low cost, low power ARM single board computer and that's actually what I did. So I had a Raspberry Pi Zero lying around and I just printed a simple enclosure for it and attached it to uh, the printer frame itself and installed Octopi on it. Octopi is no more than basically Raspbian but with Octoprint already installed and in place. So you just flash that on your uh, Raspberry Pi SD card and you have the whole thing up and running. You just have to set up Wi-Fi if you intend to use that instead of Ethernet and that's it. You just have to connect the printer using a mini USB cable to the Raspberry Pi itself and to do that since I have a Raspberry Pi Zero I actually needed to use a dongle and that's it. Now you can just access your Octoprint instance from any browser in your local network, send the G-code through that and start the print directly from Octoprint. How this works is very simple really. So the Raspberry Pi communicates with the Ender Tree via that USB through a serial connection and it just sends all the G-code instructions to the printer like that. The only downside is that you cannot stop or pause the print from the printer itself anymore. You have to use a front end for Octoprint. 
Another small issue with it is that even if you leave no power to the printer, if the Raspberry Pi is powered and the USB cable is connected to the printer, the screen stays lit and that may or may not be an issue, but anyway, I, I figured you wanted to know that. So if you really want to invest into 3D printing, I think you should really pick up a Raspberry Pi. After all, they come for very low prices. Again, I used a Raspberry Pi Zero. If you get yourself a Zero W, you don't even have to use a Wi-Fi dongle like I do. And it makes printing so much easier. I wanted to spend a couple of words on, on slicing software. So there are uh, a couple of them out there. There is the, the most popular ones are uh, um, Ultimaker Cura, Slicer with the tree uh, in the place of the E, and Simplify 3D. So uh, Simplify 3D, I didn't try it. I, I've heard wonders of it, but I didn't really want to spend any money on a slicing software, so uh, I didn't bother buying a commercial solution. Slicer is pretty good. I mean, it's a very interesting piece of software, um, but it didn't really have all the features that I wanted. On the other hand, Cura is a very nice piece of software. It's not the easiest to use because you have a lot of options and lots of them are actually hidden by default, so you may want to play around with it a little bit. And I won't go into detail about all the settings you have in Cura. If you're interested, I will leave my configuration in the description so that if you happen to have an under tree and want to know my configuration, you can just refer to it. So the thing about Cura is that it's not perfect as uh, neither are probably any of these other solutions, but it's very complete. It's in continuous development and with every new version they put in some new improvements and that's actually a thing that I appreciate a lot. And it offers lots of options and experimental features. So if you really want to make the most out of your 3D printer, at some point I think you should experiment with some of these settings for yourself and see uh, what fits your needs and what fits your particular printer's needs. So while 3D printing was pretty fun by itself, uh, it didn't come without its problems. So I've had actually quite a lot of problems with uh, both with the printer and with the filaments that I've been using. So let's start by addressing what in my opinion is the biggest issue with this printer. And it's the printing bed actually. So fortunately uh, my version compared to previous N3 versions, comes with a detachable uh, printing surface. And that alone is very important because the uh, actual printing surface is not the greatest. So the printing bed is actually not completely flat. And this is an issue with many N3s. It's a little bit concave. And while it's not very noticeable by itself, it's an issue when you have to do bed leveling. So bed leveling is like one of the most important things you have to do on your 3D printer and it makes sure that the space between the nozzle and the print bed is just right. If you don't have any auto bed leveling system on your printer, it's a huge pain, mostly because it's a manual process and it's tedious and any if you do it multiple times, over time you will have to recalibrate it. And since the print bed isn't actually flat, as I was saying, there are always some imperfections in your calibrations. So it's a huge pain to have to deal with this uh, with this problem and it actually caused more problems because since first layer adhesion is the most important probably one of the most important things for a successful print I decided to make the print stick a little bit more to the surface instead of a little bit less. So during my many different prints uh, what happened over time is that the filament actually kind of bond to the printing surface and removing that with the provided spatula, while doable, was very difficult and ultimately led to me breaking the actual printing surface. So as you see, using the spatula too hard, I actually sliced the print bed open and now it's a huge issue because my print bed is actually ruined and if I want to keep using it, I have to make sure when I slice my models that they don't touch the torn parts. As I was saying, fortunately the printing surface is replaceable and one of the easiest fixes to both the bed quality printing surface and the concave printing bed is using a glass print surface. And there are actually many of them selling online. If you're using a glass printing surface, it will be quite surely flat, so you will solve this problem and being glass, 
you won't actually be able to break it by just scraping prints off of it. So as of right now, I'm pretty discouraged from using my 3D printer, but as soon as I buy this new printing surface, I will be start printing again. So as you see here, 3D printing isn't exactly a pain-free process. I've had some more problems with my filaments, actually. So since I've got my 3D printer, I've used different filaments. The first one I bought was uh, actually pretty good. It was, uh, the brand was G-Tech and it was a white PLA. It was decently easy to work with it. The printing temperature was pretty high, uh, around 200. Sometimes I've, I've tried 210 degrees and that worked fine. So after that, I bought three different colors of PLA from a local brand and they were not actually like the best quality, but they were printing decently. The most problematic one was the clear PLA because the spools were not actually properly rolled. So I've had some problem with that filament actually bending. The red and the green PLA were doing pretty good, again at 200 degrees. And after those, I decided to buy again some G-Tech filament. And this time I bought the gray one and I've had a lot of frustration with it. Coming back to G-Tech, I knew that I could print at 200 and 210 degrees, so I just went with it, and the results were terrifying, to the point that I had to start printing benches to figure out what was going on. So while the, the red and the green PLA from the local brand were working perfectly, the gray was having these bubbly sides and these weird artifacts all over, along with a lot of stringing. So I figured that printing temperature was actually too high and I lowered that and kept lowering that until I got to 180 degrees and then prints actually started working uh, correctly. But it was not a pain-free process. I wasted lots of plastic trying to figure out what the problem was and the fact that when you buy filament it doesn't come with any information about the printing temperature doesn't help. So this is one issue along with some others that I've encountered along the way, uh, mostly uh, caused by my inexperience and some errors I was making with the slicing software. But the point that again I'm trying to make here is that 3D printing is not easy. A 3D printer is not actually a consumer electronic because if you really want to get into it, you actually have to tinker with it a lot. So you actually have to be creative and find different ways to solve the different problems you will encounter along the way. Some of them are as easy as tuning your uh, slicing software according to your filament or your printer. Others require some hardware modifications, maybe some hacks here and there, uh, probably replacing some components along the way. What I'm trying to say here is that if you think that this will turn you away from 3D printing, then just don't buy a 3D printer. On the other hand, if you think that 3D printing can add any value to your work or to your hobbies or passions, then just go for it. But again, you have to start with the mindset of solving many problems. Well, apart from all of the frustration, actually 3D printing was very useful to me. I've printed lots of useful items and accessories, along with some decorative items that are just nice to have around the house. So just make sure to stay tuned because I will show you some of my favorite items that I printed on one of my next videos. And that was it guys, this is gonna wrap it up for this video. Thank you very much for watching, I really do appreciate it. If you like this video, please make sure to press the thumbs up button down there and also remember to subscribe to my channel if you want more of this. Also make sure to check out the TechPills website at techpills.technology as well as the TechPills community at techpills.technology slash community. You will find the links in the description. So again guys, thanks for watching and I'll be seeing you in the next one.